My guest today is Yitzhak Rabin, former Prime Minister of the State of Israel, and there are many who expect him to be a future Prime Minister as well. Uh, Mr. Rabin, Americans followed the 1981 elections in Israel almost as closely as we follow our own presidential elections, and we were reading that two, three months before the actual election, that your party, Labor, was basically going to win a landslide, and for the first time in Israel's history was actually going to win a majority of seats in the Knesset and wouldn't even need the help of other parties to form a coalition. Well, we all know what happened in a very, very close race. Uh, Likud won one more seat than Labor and Begin was able to form uh, a government. What happened? Why the very, uh, that kind of a dramatic turnover? Well, first, let's uh, be more correct. I don't believe that the situation three months before the elections was as you described. It's true that about uh, six, eight months prior to the elections, it looked good uh, for the labor alignment. But in February, the beginning of a change started to take place. A new uh, Minister of Finance, uh, Mr. Arido, changed dramatically, I would say 180 degrees, the policy of his two predecessors of the Likud uh, government. He uh, made decisions in three aspects. Number one, he subsidized massively basic commodities, public uh, transportation, and practically spent the budget for subsidy for the whole year in about four or five months. Second, he readjusted the income tax scales to what they were in 75. Later on, they, they were attritioned uh, by the rate, high rate of inflation of the st in Israel. As a result of it, without increasing the brutal salaries, he increased the net revenue of most of the workers. Therefore, the worker has got increased net revenue. He spent proportionally less on basic commodities. And then came the third act. He cut about 25 to 30 percent of the tax which uh, the government normally puts on electrical appliances, color television, refrigerators, small cars. As a result of it, there was a change of the mood economically. I believe that this was the beginning of the turn in our favor. I think as a result... In your favor or against you? Against us. As a result of the change of the mood of the country, uh, Begin began to live again. And he took the opportunity that there was a change of the mood and switched the attention of the people from economic, domestic problems that look good when he started it, he used the power of government and focused on the defense issue of Israel. Started things in Lebanon. Later on, the su successful and the brilliant attack on the Iraqi nuclear reactor that was carried out by the Israeli Air Force, that no doubt added a lot to Mr. Begin. Brilliant militarily, militarily and politically? Basically militarily. I wouldn't say that it was bad politically. And later on, as a result of it, uh, there was a change, which proved, by the way, that even we had uh, six months, eight months prior to the elections, uh, tremendous support, it was superficial. It was not because we were liked so, so much, it was because the Likud was disliked much more. But after all, what is the meaning of democracy? 
choosing between alternatives, bearing in mind the positive and negative. Sometimes choosing between the lesser of two evils. Uh, I wouldn't like to put it this way, but uh, between good and, or might be, a better one. Therefore, I would say that the change started on the domestic uh, field as a result of the new policies of Mr. Arido as the finance minister that created a mood that everything was at hand, improvement of the economic situation of the individual in practical and meaningful way without basic change in the nation's economy, later on switch to defensive matters, which normally the people of Israel, when there is a threat from the outside, tend to unite be behind the government. Whichever government it might be. And I believe that uh, tactically, from the political point of view, or politics point of view, it was a masterpiece by Mr. Begin. Did the finance minister, in your opinion, make those moves purely for political considerations? I tend to believe so. Well, you know, because you served as ambassador to the United States for some five years, that Americans tend to be endlessly fascinated by controversy amongst political figures. And in the media, even in terms of this most recent election, any time the Labor Party is mentioned, the two figures that are mentioned most frequently are Rabin and Perez. And in the same breath, it's almost always mentioned that the two of you are bitter foes, if not enemies, politically. And the implication is that you're not too crazy about one another on a personal level. Could you at least give us some insight as to the background of that? First of all, is it so? And secondly, if it is so, what is the story? Well, political parties are not organizations uh, to bring in about love between people. Therefore, I don't believe that one has to seek in political life love or admiration between politicians. Well, it started many years ago between the two of us uh, during uh, my service uh, in the army and his service in defense ministry. I don't believe that uh, we saw then eye to eye on many issues. Uh, we had differences especially when I was the Chief of Staff of the Armed Forces and he was the Deputy Minister of Defense, uh, about uh, priorities, about uh, what uh, would be needed to be done. Uh, later on, we didn't have any contact when I turned uh, my military service and went to the United States. Practically, had, I had very little to do with him. Then I came back uh, to Israel, entered politics, and in 74, when uh, Golda Meir retired or resigned as a prime minister, it was for the first time in the history of the Labour Party that there was an election by the Central Committee, uh, elections between two uh, that tried to get the post of the prime minister. It was a bitter and, in a way, not so clean uh, struggle. I won with a small margin and became Prime Minister. He was Minister of Defense. And uh, I don't believe that he was loyal. Uh, being member of the cabinet, uh, the way that I believe that a member of cabinet has to be to the Prime Minister. And uh, later on, he tried it, tried it again. I know for Americans, it's normal. In Israel, it was something completely new, that within one party there, was, there would be such a prolonged competition after a decision uh, was made. And uh, no question that as a result of it, uh, many things have been accumulated, which uh, did not make it uh, so easy for the two of us to work together. Um, therefore, I would say that uh, when he won uh, in the last party convention in December 80. And when you say won, you mean he became chairman of the party? He became the chairman, and no, <coughs> chairman he became even before. 
and he became the candidate of the party to uh, my relationship with the Labour Party, with the Labour Movement, started many, many years ago. And uh, I wouldn't change parties because at any given moment there is somebody that I don't like uh, so much uh, being at the head of it. Well, with that background, it appeared fairly cynical in, in, in political terms that as Perez and Labour saw that there was the switchover in the polls and Likud was starting to increase its margin, that he then offered you, assuming Labour had won, you would have become defense minister in his cabinet. Well, I believe that it was done uh, too late. Uh, I believe it was done in a way that it was beyond the, our capability uh, to, bring, to bring about a real change in the situation. Uh, because uh, if we will start now to talk about what are the lessons, what are the consequences to the Labour Party of the elections, I would say that uh, in, our, in this case uh, there are three setbacks that we'll have to cope with them effectively if we once want to gain the elections. We suffer the setback in two basic communities of voters. The young generation didn't vote uh, in support of the Labour. I would say that the Sephardic uh, community and workers uh, didn't vote massively for labor and in a way it creates a basic problem to the labor party if labor or workers and youngsters are not supporting or did not support the labor party in the last elections there must be a dramatic change in our attitude and the third point i believe in Israel as well as in other Western democracies, there is a tendency to link the what with the who. After all, political party is not an academy. It's not a university. The question is not just to have a good ideas, which of course they are needed, and to have a clear-cut policy. You have to have people to implement it because in university, professors in uh, social sciences, political theorize. sciences, theorize, argue. They finish the <coughs> argument, and by that, it ends. The test to a politician is not just to have the right policy, to set the right goals at the right time, but to be able to prove that he can implement them. The test is in the implementation of the policies. And therefore the tendency is to link words with people. Uh, policy, the uh, ideology, with leader or leaders. And no doubt in my mind that Begin projected himself much better as a leader than Paris. And therefore we have to face basically three problems how to cope, and to become again as the Labour, as Labour Party, the party of most of the workers of his, in Israel. When I say workers, I'm not meaning only in the plants, clerks, engineers, etc., people who are employees. Second, how to win the young generation, and three, to have a better leadership. Well, it's ironic in a way that you say Begin projected an image to those particular groups because in actuality Perez is much younger than Begin. Begin is close to 70. Begin's had heart attacks and a minor stroke. Why is that? Why is, a man, uh, is such a man who's obviously capable and knows his way around unable to project the necessary image to accomplish the goals that you describe? Well, I don't believe that one can always describe what brings people to trust, to believe in certain person and not to believe in another one. I don't believe that one can really analyze it and put it in, you know, 30% is 
hit this kind of characteristics of this person. 40% is a different kind. You have to look at it in its totality. Does a person believe in a person? Does the public believe in a person or not? And therefore, any attempt to analyze it logically doesn't work. Uh, the, the, the real test is in the attitude of the people. And unfortunately, the fact was people tended to believe much more vaguely than perhaps. Well, in terms of the next election, uh, is Perez assured of, to put it in American terms, is he assured of the nomination of the Labour Party, or will there be another battle before the next general election? Well, no one can say for sure. Basically, I would say that uh, the field is open to anyone who might be uh, a, a candidate today or might uh, not mention it even today. Depends very much when the elections will take place. If they'll take place at the end of uh, 82, then uh, Paris' chances uh, to retain his position are better than if it will be four or four and a half years from now. Right, to get, to get into another area, uh, General Gore and others have said that if the PLO were simply to mouth the words without necessarily meaning the words, we recognize Israel's right to exist and we accept UN Resolution 242, he for one would be willing to negotiate with the PLO, where there is another body of opinion, both American and I'm sure Israeli, that says that that would be a great public relations move for the PLO, but it could very easily get in Israel into a serious trap by entering into du direct negotiations simply by hearing those words without anything more. What's your position on that? Well, I believe that we have to distinguish very clearly between how to proceed with the peacemaking process and how to project Israel image out in the outside world. I believe that uh, every government of Israel will be bound by the Camp David Accords and the peace treaty between Egypt and Israel. If there is any clear distinction between Israel and any one of the other Arab countries in the area, is that we are a real democracy. And what is the meaning of it? In practical terms, Whenever a government of Israel takes upon itself an international commitment, signs an international agreement, and they are ratified by the Knesset, every future government will be bound by them. I believe that the Camp David Accords by now are, must be the sole basis of every future government, present and future government, of Israel for the peacemaking process. We paid very heavily to get what is written in the Camp David Accords and in the peace treaty between Egypt and Israel. And any departure, any deviation from this basis will be a, a disaster to Israel. In accordance to the Camp David Accords, after having peace with Egypt, that was signed and implemented better, less better, uh, we have to follow now and to cope with the Palestinian problem. Again, here it was divided to two phases, five years transitional period, a title, autonomy was given to it, which by the way reminds me one a story. In 71, I asked Dr. Kissinger when I was in Washington, and he was the advisor to the president on uh, security and foreign affairs, why did you use your policy of coexistence with the Soviet Union in a foreign name, Deton? He said, this is the beauty of it. Tell me, how many Americans are really understand the meaning of this word? Therefore, we can use this word, do whatever we want. How many Americans can pronounce it, let alone understand it? And therefore, it looks to me that autonomy is exactly the same kind of a name to something that can be interpreted entirely different by whoever will have to carry out the negotiations. 
the essence of the autonomy is that Israel will be responsible to the security of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, while the Palestinians will run their civilian life for the transitional period. This is the essence of the business. We have to stick with it and to assume that once this will be achieved, new realities will be created and we'll have, we'll have to cope with the problem of permanent solution, we'll do it after we'll have an accumulated experience in living together with the Palestinians. Now, in the Camp David Accords, there are specific definitions. Who are the Palestinians with whom we have to negotiate at every stage? And there is no mentioning of the PLO. The whole concept is that we have to work together with the leaders of the West Bankers and the Gazians, regardless what they are opinions are or will be. They can be supporters of the PLO. It doesn't matter. If, for example, the mayor of Nablus, Bassam Shaka, or the mayor of uh, Ramallah, Karim Khalif, who are open supporters of the PLO, will be elected, and the, 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 the West Bankers will decide that they will represent them. Fine with me. Let's, therefore, for me, there must be a clear distinction between negotiating with Palestinians who reside in the West Bank or will be elected by the residents of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip from the people who live there to represent them and negotiation with the PLO as an organization. And why? The core of the philosophy and the policy of the PLO is against the very existence of Israel. Therefore, to say that we are ready to negotiate with the PLO once they utter something like recognition of Israel, it's real nonsense. Because what does it mean? Once Israel, and let's assume that uh, when uh, Gu or others say that they recommend it. It means that they would like that the government of Israel's policy will be as they advocate. The meaning of it is that Israel recognizes, by saying so, the basic demand of the Palestinians, the PLO, not the Palestinians, the PLO, an independent state west of the River Jordan. I believe that if Israel will agree, to have a Palestinian state, a PLO state, in the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and the Gaza Strip, we are going to make the worst mistake in the history of the State of Israel. Because it will give a springboard, political springboard, not a military one, political springboard for the PLO to pursue its policy and regardless what agreement we were signed or will be signed. A PLO Palestinian state will drag the Arab world again to a war. One has to realize international agreements in this area have no such a meaning as the average American will give to them. Just take for example what happened between Iran and Iraq, two Muslim countries. In 75, the present president of Iraq, Saddam Hussein, signed an agreement with the Shah of Iran in which they settled down all the territorial problems, the right of navigation in the Shat al Arab, the Persian Gulf. Five years later, after the toppling down of the Shah regime, after the United States were expelled, was expelled from Iran, no backing, no American backing to Iran, the same guy who signed the agreement believed that the strategic situation was changed. And he could now, by the use of force, get what he had to give in when he signed the agreement. He tore to pieces the agreement, went to war, 
used the whole strength of the Iraqi armed forces, hopeful that the Iranian army was in complete disarray, to get what he agreed to give. If two Muslim countries behave this way, there should be no illusion that no Muslim leader will have any problem to do the same with the Jewish state of Israel. Well, that's why so many people say, for example, although Sadat is recognized as being very, very courageous and probably does better in the public opinion polls in America than any Israeli, the point being made is that whenever Sadat goes, however he goes, through peaceful means or through some form of revolution, the piece of paper that he signed with Israel, for which Israel gave up something very, very tangible, Agreed. huge territory, air bases, and all the rest. So what about the risk that Israel's taken in that context? Yes. That would seem to make the argument that yeah, what is our what agreement is with Sadat worth? What is the difference? In whatever Israel will do in the search of peace, we'll have to give tangibles and to get intangibles papers, goodwill, beginning, Promises. Of, uh, beginning of relationship, but there is a basic difference because Egypt has no claim, no historic claim, no political claim over Palestine, what used to be Palestine, what is now Israel. The Syrians, the Jordanians, the Lebanese, the Iraqis, the Saudis, no one of them have, have ever claimed that they have the right to rule this area. All that they say, as they used to say, and I believe some of them will continue to say, the Palestinians must rule it. Therefore, there is a clear distinction in taking risks with Egypt for the sake of peace vis-a-vis uh, -vis allowing the PLO, which its basic policy is against the very existence of Israel, to have a state. And I must admit that they have never tried to cheat. They have never lied. They have stated time and again that they are against what they describe Zionism, it is to say, the right of the Jews to have a sovereign state of their own. Therefore, whoever proposes that will do it, believes that he'll win in the PR battle. He will win for a week or two weeks, but he'll lose in the long run because no one will be able to say that he doesn't know what is the PLO, at least in his world. No one will be able to say that by saying so, he is not practically admitting that he recognizes the right of the PLO to represent the Palestinians and accepting that they have got the right to have a state of their own, independent sovereign state, west of the River Jordan. Therefore, I believe it's a major mistake and I oppose it vehemently. In the context of American foreign relations, do you see any inherent weakness in the system, which has, you mentioned Kissinger early, when he was national security advisor to President Nixon before he became Secretary of State, to have a national security advisor as well as a Secretary of State when sometimes they have opposing views. And of course, the two most recent examples, Kissinger, before he became Secretary of State, when Rogers was Secretary of State, Brzezinski, as national security advisor for Carter, Vance, Secretary of State, when in terms of the way these men projected themselves to the public, both Kissinger and Brzezinski were infinitely stronger personalities than the actual secretaries of states. So in terms of how you, as an Israeli, both as prime minister and as ambassador to the United States, how, did that ever create any problems for you? Well, it's not up to me to say what's good or bad for the United States. It's your system. Why do, why do all the Israelis always say that? I would love to, I would love to have a problem no, in Israeli. I understand. I understand that according to your system, when the president is the chief executive 
uh, agency of your political system. He needs within the White House advisors that will help him in addition to the members of the cabinet. And uh, therefore the question is not the basic organization, but how to mend them with what kind of personalities. Uh, my own experience with this system, uh, I must uh, say that uh, for me, it served a purpose because I could play on the rivalries between the White House and State Department, on the differences. And uh, I must admit that, uh, for example, during my term as ambassador, I think I went to the White House to kind of entrances and left the White, uh, the White House in kind of exits that normally no ambassadors uh, would say because they had to be secret that no one would uh, know about it, not only the press, even the State Department. And uh, in a way it was very helpful and it helped uh, basically the interest of Israel, I believe also the interest of the United States and why. When I served as ambassador, most of my time was with the Nixon administration and later on as a prime minister with the Nixon and the Ford administrations. I think these two presidents believed in direct contacts between them and the prime minister of Israel. And as a result of it, they wanted to have a direct channel that will go not to the State Department, but from the White House to other head of states. It was not vis-a-vis -vis Israel alone. It was no doubt vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union, no doubt vis-a-vis -vis the head of governments of uh, other uh, countries that were close or friendly uh, to the United States. Well, certainly. And it, it was decided that the channel would be White House, the ambassador of Israel in Washington. I continued it when I was prime minister. Uh, and I think uh, this direct links between the Prime Minister of Israel and the President of the United States to the White House it was good. It prevented many leakages because the condition was that we avoided both foreign ministries, including in Israel. And uh, of course the same was done vis-a-vis -vis the State Department. I believe a personal relationship between leaders of the world, of course between the leading uh, country in the free world, the United States, and other democratic countries all over the world, are of great importance. And personal relationship, personal contacts, personal discussions, capability to transmit on a personal basis, I believe help stability in the world and understanding better what is going on and how to work together. Well, certainly for the American system, it's a human relations problem because obviously a strong or even a weak Secretary of State is going necessarily to resent tremendously contacts between someone who's not even a member of the cabinet, even though he is an advisor to the president, doing things with a foreign government that he, the Secretary of State, is not aware of. So from the American perspective, I think there are built-in problems. I don't believe that it was done this way. It was not uh, against an agreed policy, but it was in elaborating future policies, reaction to certain developments. Uh, for example, there was a crisis in 1970, September 1970, when King Hussein had a showdown with the PLO in Jordan. The Syrian army invaded uh, Syria. And there was a call upon Israel. Invaded Jordan. The Syrian yeah, army. In, invaded. The Syrian army invaded Jordan. And there was a call upon Israel by King Hussein and the United States government to intervene for the sake of King Hussein. In this kind of environment, in this kind of Middle East that upheavals and the unpredicted happen more than the predicted there is a need to work closely with the top echelon. Well, 
that 1970 example is just loaded with ironies in the sense that Hussein is asking Israel to assist him. And the great supposed brotherly love between the Arabs, people forget that there was a civil war almost in Jordan between the PLO, which was a government within a, within it a was state. A civil it war. was a civil war. And exactly the problem in Lebanon today is because of the fact that there is no real effective central government in Lebanon, exactly. and the most effective force is the PLO. People are very quick to forget that. Well, no doubt that uh, too many Americans see the Arab world as one entity. For them, all the Chinese look the same. <laughs> look alike. The same applies to the Arabs, but it's not true. If you look today, Iraq and Iran, even though Iran is a Muslim country, are at war. I believe that the Saudis are happy that the Iraqis are stuck in that war, and I believe they support them to continue it, because by that, the Saudi Arabia eliminates two of its potential immediate enemies. Uh, there is no love lost between Jordan and Syria. The same applies between Iraq and Syria. Syria is bogged down in Lebanon. Egypt and Libya, there is no need just uh, to, to elaborate about it. Go on what is said on record, on television, by President Sadat about President Gaddafi and by President Gaddafi about President Sadat. The, world, the Arab world is not so united. It is united when things are brought up in the United Nations, which after all has no real meaning in terms of being able to settle problems. And the fact that the whole peace process between the Arab countries and Israel had very little, had very little to do when it started has very little to do today with the United Nations. It's very strange. The whole Camp David, the calls, the negotiations about, about them, the peace treaty negotiations between Egypt and Israel, the signing of the peace treaty between Egypt and Israel, the United Nations was not a factor. And therefore, when uh, the average American looks at the United Nations, especially in New York, where he sees on television all the debates there, the General Assembly, it's, uh, it's all f nonsense. They play democracy there while over one, two-thirds of the country members of the United Nations have no democracy in their own country. They play democracy of voting in the United Nations and they don't allow any voting in their own country. The Communist Bloc and practically the whole third world. Has the UN outlived its usefulness, do you think? Is there any point in well, continuing it? Well, since there is nothing better at, 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 at this time, well, let's live with it. But uh, being so It's once, like chicken soup. Being, it, may, it may not really help, but it doesn't hurt necessarily. No, it hurt. hurts. I, it I would hurt. say, I would say, bearing in mind that I served my country for 27 years as a soldier, I would describe the UN, United Nations as a kind of a battlefield that Israel can never win. The question is how big we lose to. I think that uh, since when it comes to Israel, the whole United Nations is prejudiced, no meaning. I believe that once uh, Mr. Eben, when he was uh, our foreign minister, said that if the Arab world will come and pass a resolution and demand a resolution, that the world is not round but flat, they'll get at least two-thirds of the members in support of their resolution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very well, much. Oh, okay. no, no. Oh, sorry. You want to do another 20 minutes? No. You have the time? No, I don't believe okay. so. Okay. All right. Okay. Look, please. Sorry.
Thank you. Okay.